Well, the beginning of a brand new year. And who can tell what brand new... I'm sorry. Why do we keep acting like this? Why do we keep pretending that just because it's a new year, some great big new changes are coming, and this year is going to be any different than the crap that we went through last year? I mean, seriously, why do we keep acting anymore? Nothing ever changes. Everything will continue to be the same exact level of crap that it was last year. Roll the damn logo. That was new. Uh... <coughs> Hello, Winternet! Welcome to Tales of Showcase, where the logo may change, but the crappy quality of comedy will not. I'm your host, the Watcher of New Earth. Now, we have another Captain America number one to look through today. Although, this one's history is a little weirder. This issue was done by the creative team of Mark Wade and Ron Garney, who were both known for doing a Captain America series prior to this. In the mid-90s, the X-Men, yes, this starts with the X-Men, that's how you know it's going to be complicated. The X-Men faced off against a villain known as Onslaught. As the situation grew worse and worse, more heroes gathered to help. This culminated in a climactic battle that saw the death of the Fantastic Four and a lot of the Avengers. But it turns out they didn't actually die, but were actually in an alternate dimension for a year. You know. The usual. This story centered around Captain America returning to his proper universe after being separated from the group that was already returning to his proper universe. Confused? So am I. This is Captain America number one from 1998. Our story opens in Japan. Because with our new commander-in-chief, not even Captain America wants to be in the United States. We start off in an American-themed restaurant and... You know, that feels really weird to say. Anyway, it's currently under attack. Apparently, the armed men are enraged by Japan embracing Western culture. Whoa, 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 whoa. Settle down there. I mean, I will agree that over-Westernization is a problem. But have you ever been to an anime convention here? This is working both ways. The lead guy grabs the Torch of Liberty and moves to burn the flag. Suddenly, Cap's shield busts in and knocks the torch away. Cap catches it and tells him to not even think about it. Yeesh. Cat must not have been happy with the Supreme Court ruling a few years later. Cat moves to apprehend the criminals, but is immediately crowded by the patrons of the restaurant. By the time he breaks free and reaches the outside, they've disappeared. He goes to two police officers to ask for help, but they don't believe a man simply play along with his act. Be honest. It's the headwings, isn't it? Cap walks away, naturally confused. He finally begins to question why he's actually in Japan, as the last thing he remembers is fighting Onslaught the day before. He stops by a newsstand which seems to click something and he's on the move. However, once he leaves, the Fantastic Four appear on TV, declaring their return and saying that Thor, Iron Man, and Captain America have gone missing. That's all well and good, but, um... Can we take a moment and talk about the Thing's face here? Anyone else think it looks really sunken and elongated? He looks like Grimm from the Grimm Adventures of Billy and Mandy. And suddenly, the name Ben Grimm takes on a whole new meaning. Meanwhile, we cut to the home of Lady Deathstrike. Or for you more casual fans, Lucy Liu from X2. The leader of the terrorist group from before, who turns out to be named Osamu, has gone to Deathstrike seeking help for his cause. However, Deathstrike reveals that she knows of Osamu's past. Apparently, Osamu once belonged to another group of, with anti-Western sentiments. However, when the entire group martyred themselves, Osamu ran. Osamu says that this new group is Atonement. He also tells Deathstrike about Cap, which finally convinces her to join and...
Well, there's my nightmare fuel for the next couple months. Although Deathstrike agrees to join, she warns Osamu that if he flees again, she'll kill him herself. Meanwhile, Cap is trying to make his way to the American Embassy. He opts to get out of costume to prevent being stopped by onlookers. As he's walking, he runs into a giant statue of himself. So, Japan has a giant Captain America statue, but America doesn't. Damn it, we suck. It turns out that a movie about Cap is premiering that night which is why the authorities believe that the terrorist attack and Cap were a state publicity stunt. Cap turns his attention to reporters who are questioning a city representative about over-westernization. They then question Cap, thinking he's just another American tourist. This gets Cap thinking. On the one hand, he remembers Japan from the 40s and marveling at how unique its culture was. On the other hand, it's very important to him how the world perceives America. Now this sparks a legitimate question. Where does Captain America stand on westernization? I mean, sure, it's easy to say, oh, he's a soldier, he doesn't have to worry about this. And while that is a legitimate point, in this universe, Captain America is seen as the be-all, end-all symbol of America. Not only that, his heroism sparks praise from all over the world. His opinion holds a lot of sway. So it begs the question, does Captain America stand by the spread of capitalism and consumerism, even though a country might be split on whether or not they want it? It's an interesting topic, one which, in memory, I don't remember a Captain America book ever tackling. The interview ends abruptly as Cap notices Osamu walk by. He leaves and tells a reporter to call the police. Uh, hi, 911? Yeah, how are you? Never mind. Uh, some guy in a trench coat just told me to call the police. Yes, a trench coat. I, I, I don't know. He was wearing some sort of Captain America uniform underneath his coat. Of course it wasn't the real Captain America. How do I know? Because Marvel heroes wear baseball caps and jackets when they're hiding. You frickin' Nimrod. He hello? Hello? The movie begins as Osamu's men place gas canisters throughout the theater. When they're about to set them, however, Cap strikes. The brawl goes on stage, but the audience assumes it to be a part of the show. Deathstrike then joins the fight as she and Cap go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Cap manages to trick her into disconnecting the gas. However, two remain under the control of Osamu. As he and Deathstrike continue to fight, the movie continues behind them. Cap, however, gets distracted when the movie reveals that he's been gone for a year. This gives Deathstrike enough time to land a good blow. Classic conceited Americans, always getting distracted by seeing themselves on screen. Cat manages to finally take down Deathstrike. He asks where Osamu is, but Osamu calls down from the catwalk, claiming that Cap is too late. Cap, however, sees Osamu glancing at the exit. Cap then yells at him, saying that he won't do it. When Osamu insists that he will, Cap tosses his shield, blocking off the exit. Cap then climbs onto the catwalk as Osamu collapses, saying he can't do it. Also, <laughs> I love the way Cap looks down on him here. You can just see it on his face. He's just looking down at him saying, come on, dude. Come, I already beat you. Don't, don't, cr don't. Ah, oh, jeez, he's crying. With the danger over, people rejoice the return of the beloved captain. However, as the reporter begins saying how Cap is seen as an icon to the world, this leads to him getting a little introspective. Meanwhile, we cut to Istanbul, where Sharon Carter has just learned of Cap's return and is taking her frustration out on these guys. I take long walks to relieve stress. Sharon Carter beats people up. We then cut to Wisconsin, where a shadowy figure exits what appears to be a lab. We then cut to neither. Oh, I hear the weather's nice there. And our comic actually ends in neither, with Kang the Conqueror saying that he has plans for Captain America. Bum, bum, bum. Anyways, that was Captain America number one. It was... okay. The story is rather interesting, raising questions that no other Cap book asks. We also get some great character work with Cap himself, as we see he's more than just a mindless flag waver. The art, however... Ugh. Okay, maybe that's an exaggeration. Most of the issue is passable, and some shots are downright awesome, but others clearly still have a case of the 90s.
although I guess that's not really a fault of the artist, but rather a fault of the times. Certainly not the best Captain America number one I've ever read, but definitely not the worst comic I've ever read either. Anyways, as always, thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time. This is The Watcher of New Earth, signing off.